Welcome back to the show. We got a great one lined up here. 10% of the world's GDP tokenized by 20 will tell you because it's Ripple telling us. And then we got this, Ripple weighing in on their options to sue the SEC. New stablecoin bill before Christmas. It may be getting more real than you think. Somebody roll that beautiful intro. Digital Perspectives with Brad Kimes. Come on in. Welcome back to the show. You can follow us on Twitter, YouTube, and digperspectives.com for exclusive content. Right now, $2.3 trillion market cap for crypto. The market's up 1.2. We see 63000 plus for Bitcoin, 2400 plus for Ethereum, $119 billion plus market cap for Tether. It's $34 billion plus, almost $35 billion for uh, USDC market cap. XRP at number seven is $50. Four cents. We're up 1.2 on the 24 hour, 1.7 on the seven day. Let's look at the range of price very quickly between 53, 54 cents. We'll keep an eye on it. Take a look at this. The food stamp warrior, ladies and gentlemen, you know him. It's John Deaton will be the next senator of Massachusetts. Write it down. Write it down. I'm asking all of you in this final push And we are in the final push, ladies and gentlemen. In just three days, you're going to see the first debate with John Deaton and Senator Warren. He is going to destroy her. And I'm telling you right now, this is a guy who is a former JAG attorney. Don't worry about what the polls are saying right now because we know the polls are liars, right? We know that they're just as, they are just as compromised as our mainstream media. Don't worry about the polls. Worry about the debate. And in three days, the first one happens, and two days later, the second one. So October 15th, October 17th, I wouldn't miss it for the world. Let's watch John win in real time. Uh, Right here, we know the SEC's approach has been called a disaster for the whole industry, and we know Hester Peirce has been very critical of Gary Gensler's SEC, and now Mark Udaya coming out as well. Just listen very quickly here. Well, it's great to be here. What is the SEC doing regarding crypto? Well, I think our our policies and our approach the last several years have been just really a disaster for the whole industry. We have been there. You go, and it is. And guess what? There's more. Here, Brad Garlinghouse on this on Masari's mainnet stage. Like, what's he having for breakfast that I'm not? Yeah. Because in the real world that I'm living in, whatever Elizabeth Warren's putting in his Cheerios. So. <laughs> and there you have that. But let's listen here. A new low for a renegade agency. This is in response to Bitnomio Exchange has filed a suit against the SEC because they've put in, the, when they sent the, the, the complaint to Bitnomio about not letting them have XRP futures, they submitted their summary judgment, but then didn't let the courts know that, by the way, they lost on summary judgment. So there's more arbitrary, capricious activity, unfaithful allegiance to the law happening in the Bitnomial case again now from the SEC. Response to that, Brad Garlinghouse says, a new low for a renegade agency many thought couldn't sink further. The SEC now believes it can operate above the law, ignoring a court's ruling that XRP isn't a security. Team Ripple will be watching closely and weighing our own options to hold the SEC accountable. I hope, Brad, that you do sue the SEC. I really, really do hope that you sue them. They deserve it. They've worked for it very hard. Stuart Alderati response to the Brad Garlinghouse post, all based around what's happening to Bitnomial and the unfaithful allegiance to the law that we see happening there by the SEC. He says, if this were a law school blue book exam, the hypothetical scenario would be a regulatory agency loses in court but still threatens enforcement to pressure compliance, raising major constitutional concerns and further compromising the legitimacy of the agency. This is why I believe in the summary judgment portion of the case with Ripple, they submitted the argument about the blue sky laws as a way to bring things back to the foundational principles and laws that were put in place to begin securities law to begin with. 
And I think this is a reminder to get us back to the law inside of the court system using this case to do so. That's why I believed it's going to the Supreme Court, barring any legislation that could end this immediately, which I welcome. Then we see this. Are we going to get legislation before the end of the year or before Christmas even? It has been floated a couple times. Just really quickly for those that don't know, Tom Emmer said just a few days ago that it could be possible for us to get a portion of the Fit 21 bill done before Christmas because... They could attach it to the end of year spending bill so that way it would be less likely that Biden would veto it. Now, more signs that that could be getting some actual uh, uh, traction is right here. With pressure from the crypto industry and key Republicans, and you can bet some Democrats that are crypto advocates too, crypto sanctions were dropped from a Democrat bill that would have given them broad powers to cut off exchanges. And what have I been saying? That's what they were after. They want the banks to run this space. But you're going to see what is actually taking shape now. Remember what I've said. Generally speaking, the left side of the aisle, the Dems want to have Fed control. And on the right side of the aisle, the the Republicans want to have state control oversight, right? So watch how this is starting to take shape here. So Mark Warner has dropped plans to push for new cryptocurrency sanctions in legislations that would reauthorize intelligence programs, a person direct with knowledge of the situation. So they're changing their game. Now, Senator Haggerty, soon to be the senator for my wife and I, because we'll be moving to Nashville at some point. For for too long, the benefits and promise of stablecoins have been hindered by a lack of legal clarity. He says, my new draft legislation builds off Patrick McHenry's work and establishes the framework necessary to unlock this technology's potential benefit to Americans. Now, take a look here. This is what's going on. If you look at this, the breakdown on this is pretty It's pretty exciting to me because this is the way Congress is supposed to work. It's how it used to work back in the day, right? Take a listen. It says right here, he released a discussion draft, clear regulatory framework for stablecoin issuers. Stablecoins had the potential to not only enhance transactions and payment system, but also help create new demand for U.S. Treasuries as we work to address our unsustainable deficit. And this is what I've said, that stable coins become a sponge or a bulkhead to soak up these U.S. treasuries. This is exactly what the senator is acknowledging. For too long, these benefits and broader promise of stable coins have been hindered by the lack of clear regulations. He says, my draft provides much needed clarity, putting in place legal framework necessary to unlock this technology full potential for the benefit of Americans. Here he says, it builds on the Clarity Payment Stable Coins Act and introduced by House Financial Services Committee Chairman Patrick McHenry. The bill exempts, exempts users of less than $10 billion in total stable coins from federal regulation. So if you're smaller than $10 billion, it would be allowing them to remain under the oversight of state regulators. Issuers exceeding $10 billion threshold may seek a waiver from their applicable federal regulator to stay under state regulation. Additionally, the legislation designates that the Federal Reserve as the supervisor of issuers that are depository institutions and makes the Office of Comptroller of Currency the supervisor of federally qualified non-bank issuers. So now we get the left wants federal control, state wants control, or right side of the aisle wants state control. Now they're splitting the baby. Okay, well, if it's less than $10 billion, let's let it be state regulation. If it's more than $10 billion, let's put it under Federal Reserve and OCC uh, qualified non-bank issuers there. So this seems like a path that could go forward here. Head on a swivel, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, we're not done yet. And we're getting an applause from the one and only Digital Chamber. Shout out to Perry Ann, Cody, Maris, and the whole team over there. They're all remarkable, and they're doing incredible work. And they applaud uh, Senator Haggerty for introducing his new Clarity for Payment Stablecoins Act discussion draft, providing needed 
leg, regulatory clarity or certainty for USD stablecoins. It's time to unlock stablecoins potential in a safe, predictable environment. And here's even more support from Jeremy Allaire and Dante Desparte from Circle themselves. Closing in on a bill that can pass both chambers and reach the president's desk in December. What a victory for the U.S. to take the dollar forward into the age of the Internet. Ladies and gentlemen, this may happen. This may happen. I'm not saying it is, but I'll tell you what. This is a big step forward, and we should watch very closely here. Uh, Because if they're giving that split and nobody's pushing back in the House or the Senate on it, this may go down. And then they want to take credit for it. But in true fashion... They're not able to get it done in order to benefit at the poll. It's just, um, anyway, <laughs> I don't want them to win anyway. Raul Advani says here, policy director of Ripple stated, Ripple will play pivotal role in bridging this area's gap between crypto and fiat worlds, which means that the stablecoin legislation is absolutely mission critical because we're going to bridge the gap between traditional finance and the modern new digital era we're moving into. Meanwhile, we see some confusion out here because Ripple co-founder Chris Larson donates $1 million in XRP to Kamala Harris. Now listen, we know that uh, Chris is a liberal and a Democrat and, and has always been, right? So good for Chris. Chris is putting the money where he believes he can put it. But I also believe, too, this is business. And in business, because he is a board member and a chairman of Ripple, you know what? Have him donate to the side right now. Hedge your bets. And then have Brad Garlinghouse take a neutral approach because he is actually the face of the company right now. And don't take a discernible difference other than from Brad's approach. He just wants clarity, whether he gets it from Harris or whether he gets it from Biden or whether he gets it from Trump and the new administration. So I think this is the right play to make. And understanding that there's been more money put into super PACs and lobbyists in history of crypto's existence and knowing that Chris Larson is putting this donation to Harris right now. I would expect something to get done no later than 2025 because of that amount of money. Let's get real here. Our system is pay to play. That shouldn't be breaking news to anybody. And here is the breaking news of Chris donating the 1 million XRP to Kamala Harris. An FEC filing just out this week shows that the Ripple Labs co-founder Chris Larson donated $1 million in the XRP token to the Future Forward Super PAC. Now, that committee is supporting the VP's run for the White House and began accepting donations in digital tokens back in September. Now, here's what's funny about all of this. We know that the SEC is going to appeal, and they've actually hinted, whether it's the Bitnomial case or other little tidbits we've seen, that they do not agree with the fact that XRP is not a security, which is the law of the land. If they were to go back and somehow try to challenge that or some other issue of that, you have to ask yourself, well, did Kamala Harris just accept something that would now target her by the SEC? Oh, gear, 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 bear. Uh, you know, it's just incredible. It doesn't matter who wins the election, says subjective views. Blockchain and crypto adoption moves forward. I do believe this, but I'm also scared of Harris and everything that she has said. Uh, I, I absolutely am terrified of, of Harris. I have not seen a sensible, a sensible sentence come out of that woman's mouth ever. It's just, it's quite baffling, to be honest with you. I'm not sure what's going on there. But nonetheless, Uphold says, 10% of the global GDP is expected to be tokenized. And then they say, here's your XRP report of the week. Ripple is supercharging its Ripple custody service. The latest feature includes enhanced transaction screening, Amazon Web Services, Cloud HSM integration, and direct XRP Ledger integration for real-world asset tokenization. With crypto assets projected to reach $16 trillion in custody by 2030 and 10% of the global GDP expected to be tokenized, Ripple Custody aims to lead the way in simplifying management and security of digital assets, no doubt about it. Look, Uh, They're talking about 10% of the global GDP is expected to be tokenized. Uphold is partnered with Ripple for enterprise-to-enterprise solutions. 
And if they're bullish on this, they believe this number. Now, what's interesting about this is, you know what? You need to hear this because uh, what you're about to hear is Brooks Entwistle tell you this is the, the exact agenda uh, that Ripple believes as well, but by year 2027. Take a listen. We actually believe and put a lot of faith behind this World Economic Forum report that says that just a huge percent, 10% of the world's GDP could be tokenized by 2027. 10%. Now, whether it's 27 or 2030, I mean, you could wrestle over that all you want. But what is 10%? Well, Grok couldn't give me a direct answer. But just kind of ballparking it, 100 to 110 trillion, which I think is absolutely low, extremely low, in fact. Because just here, the world's biggest economies, you know, they're showing numbers. It, anyway, but let's just go with that. And let's just say it's 100 trillion, the lower number. Let's take 10%. That's 10 trillion. Well, we're already at two. Well, that puts us at 12 trillion in the crypto market. In the next 24, 26 months is what Brooks Entwistle just suggested. <laughs> Makes a good amount of sense why Ripple's launched that bank grade custody solutions, right? Because you're going to have that many trillions of dollars coming from the banks and institutions, you're going to need a qualified custodian to put it somewhere. Dark Defender says XRP closes here. Three-month candle above the initial support in silence. He says the new three-monthly candle, October, November, December, is loading up. There is no space anymore in the triangle. We will see an extraordinary breakout starting this month, he says. And here is the chart. In October, November, December, ladies and gentlemen, that's where our next spot is. We're waiting right here. We're ready. Let's see what happens. And speaking of which, here's the one and only Egg Rag Crypto along with Dark Defender here. XRP linear regression, time and target projections. You know what's amazing about this? I'll tell you, the way he draws these charts are just absolutely fantastic. And a simpleton like me can even understand it. That's where I get so excited. Because <laughs> I know if I could get it, anyone could get it. All right. So what I love about this is it, you see these channels. Top line of this channel. Bottom line of this channel. You see the middle of the channel, right? And what I love is how he grabs these different points. Like if it were to have this sudden breakout, you'd hit $1.85. If it were to be a stronger breakout directly right here, just parabolic, boom, no up or down, just going right up, you hit 570. If you kind of putz around, you go up, you tip around, then you hit here at April 15th. You can see the timeline down here. You'd be at $2.40. If it was a sudden surge by then and it busted loose, we could hit $7.30, $7.30. Go on up to here. You can see you could be at $3. What he doesn't know is what we all don't know, right? Is how long we move this way up and down or move sideways before we get that fundamental news that unlocks this market. Now, we just went over some fundamental news and speculation that could suggest we get crypto legislation by December, by Christmas, which is, let's say, before January, which would mean we might want to pay very close attention to that April 15th target of 2025. Because imagine getting that legislation passed, and if it's signed, then you have a few months where the market really starts to get on board, react to it, and then four months or so into it, it's just going cray-cray in the best way. How about that for a scenario? We don't know what will happen, but I tell you what, I'm super grateful for Eggrag Crypto, Dark Defender, and all the other technical analysts that share what they're seeing on the charts here and what a moment this is. And any one of these things I think are going to be absolutely uplifting to all of us for as long as we've been here. We know where we need to go, and it's a long ways off, but I tell you what, I'm more bullish as hell that we're going to get there. I hope you are too. Not financial advice from me or anyone else. It's just my digital perspectives. And you could join us in the Freedom Zone if you go to digperspectives.com and click the Freedom Zone and come on in. I just want to thank all of you that have come in and supported the channel for less than the cost of a cup of coffee per month. It is super appreciated because censorship is very real and we deal with it on a daily basis on YouTube. There's no question. 
super grateful for all of you that donate. No doubt about it. Well, we're going into the Freedom Zone right now. And today we're going to talk about the woke Marxist playbook. And I tell you something, I don't know that I've ever seen it broke down in this manner. And I'm glad that I'm going to be able to bring this and share it with you. I hope you'll join us. We're going into the Freedom Zone right now. Not financial advice from me or anyone else. Come on in. All right, 